The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. I can't help you outside of faith. It requires faith. It requires your simple belief in Christ, that He did die on the cross for us, and that through His death, and He was a sacrifice, you can repent. It also requires a belief in His gospel. He is the one who told us and gave that knowledge to His disciples, that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, which is to say, you're not at war with your fellow man. You are at war with what manipulates, encourages, or discourages your fellow man. Because at the root of all things is a spiritual happening. The unseen realm that we can't see is where confusion begins. Murder began with Satan. Jesus said he was a murderer from the beginning. He's the author of confusion. He is the accuser of the brethren. He opposes the word of God. He is in fact behind whatever happened to you. He utilized somebody against you. If you can see that, if you can see that a spirit was responsible for whatever happened to you, that it manipulated a person, that it nudged a person, you're on your way to being free yourselves. A person cannot be free if they do not forgive. And I mean truly forgive. Forgiveness is not something you do with your mouth. Forgiveness is something that is very real. And you know you have forgiven when you love that person again. If you no longer blame a person but can see the spirits working behind the scenes in that person's life, you can easily forgive that person. The battle is against spirits. The battle is against the darkness. That's the first step, forgiveness. And you do that so that you can be forgiven. There's something else, something we're going to talk about briefly tonight. It involves Christ. It involves your belief in Christ. In fact, it challenges your belief in Christ. It really does. It's not meant to be offensive. It's meant to comprehend, to analyze, to see for yourselves, to be honest with yourself. Because there are a great many people we know in the Word of God that by mouth said they believed. Even by their lifestyle, they reflected that belief. But we know they did not believe. They know they did not believe. Some people, by way of tradition, by way of habits or their family life, culture, they have certain ways about them that will cause them to seem like believers. But do you believe? That's what we're going to talk about tonight. Because this next step, actually believing, is very important. And it's not believing any way a person believes. It's not believing the way a person would think a belief is. Nope. It's actually believing in Christ. Actually believing His Word. So that you can begin to walk in a power so potent, no darkness can penetrate it ever again. It'll cause you to see the world differently. It'll instantly defeat depression. In most cases, sickness. It has rejuvenation, fingerprints. It does. It'll renew your mind. In the word of God, it says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. For your mind cannot be renewed if you're thinking in the same patterns, with the same perspective that you did when you were in the world. Time to see a truth. But you see, some people you're going to find out tonight, sometimes... The truth is not so easily accepted. Sometimes, what is, you're going to find out in most cases, is based on each individual. It's not about how things actually are. It's about how they are. It's about how you are. That's why so many people see things so differently. Because it's about them. It's why people disagree. Because it's about them. That's how they see the world to themselves. Now, if everybody saw the world through one eye, nobody would argue. If everybody could see everything in the world through one lens, no one would disagree. But we see the world through ourselves, and sometimes and often it obscures life. And all of you who have had an issue with forgiveness, all of you who have been backstabbed, who have been pierced in the heart from time to time, you have some residue we're going to have to get rid of. It will attack love itself. You know what your father is, right? Your father in heaven is love. Which should let you know instantly, love is not just some feeling that you have. Long time ago in COT, I established one of those good old COT definitions. And I gave part of an explanation of love. Love is not a feeling. Love is a power. The feeling you get is a residue from love itself. But it within itself is not love at all. Love is not a feeling. 
We react to love. We react in the presence of love. We react in the absence of love. But love is not a feeling. In fact, love is not what's inside of us. Not by way of your biological body. No. Love is something different. And it truly is your father. So, let's get to the heart of this topic. So, you guys haven't forgiven people because you understand spirits are working behind them. How many did that? How many could see it was spirits working within people causing them to do what they did? That indeed they've been following you all your life, which is why people have these similar statements and similar phrases they use toward you. They also have similar tactics because it's the exact same spirit that keeps coming back through many different vessels in your life trying to get to you. Listen, they wouldn't try to get to you if you were not a threat to them. Don't get the big hit behind that, but it's true. They do not waste their time. They only hit targets that can trouble them, that can really destroy what they're doing. You happen to be one of those, and it's important that you really understand what's happening behind the veil so that you can release people finally and get on with your business as a citizen of the kingdom of God. So having forgiven those in your life, and I hope you have. If you cannot do that yet, you're going to have to resolve the issue of spirits working through people. You're going to have to resolve that. It takes reading. It takes prayer. Most of all, it takes you requesting from the Most High to allow you to see the truth of what's been happening. We have to face some truth here. It is time. And again, facing truth is not easy. Because one of the goals in the next couple of days is for us to be able, for you to be able, to walk in love again. To actually choose that path of love again. And to begin to walk in that path of love again. That's your goal. That's what this, this darkness has been trying to keep you away from that. Which is why love, that definition of love for so many of you, is something you don't really want to talk about. Something you don't trust. It's why you have trust issues. It's why you think that people are going to wrong you before a relationship ever gets started. Okay? Because they have left a fingerprint in you. And it's time to get that fingerprint lifted. It's time to do away with that. You are to be a clean vessel. And then the healings can begin. Healings cannot begin when you have fingerprints of darkness within you. And you often act on them. No healing can take place. When the root or the heart of something that is rotting of fruit is still in the fruit. You cannot heal the fruit because it will continue. It's, it's almost like mold. Mold will continue to grow until you remedy the mold. But so long as you have the mold, you can clean the outside of something all day. It's not going to purify it. You have to clean the inside. Once you clean the inside, everything begins to heal. The key, once you clean the inside, the key to doing that is the key to being clean. The whole thing can be clean. So we start from the inside, not the outside. It does not matter if the outside is clean when the inside is rotting away. Now let me break this for you because your father is so good. Never take offense because you belong to him. And there are some out there that don't belong to him. Many of you, you're not really telling anybody, but you've been concerned. Something biological is eating away at you. And it has concerned you. You don't know how it started, but it started. And it's almost amplified. And it's taking a toll. You don't have to confess this. Just let me talk for a second. But for many of you, certain conditions have formed. These conditions eat away at what was once whole. These conditions vary, but they're all the same thing. Your father loves you, and the only way he can get our attention most often is to reflect things upon our bodies, because we will go take care of certain things when our bodies start to collapse, when things go wrong, right? What we don't often realize is the father is always involved in your life, and things he'll cause manifestations like these to happen to get our attention. Because ultimately, we will, we will most certainly reflect upon it. You don't have to believe that, but it happens all around the world, generation to generation. Now, some people who are absolutely devoid of servitude, they can maintain perfect health, but not you, not you, because your father loves you, right? And he, and if he has to, your whole body is of no concern compared to your soul. That means, just like me, if he had to have me a quadriplegic, to get my attention, then so be it. you know why? Because your soul is eternal. And so many times we don't think about that. We don't even think that we're about to leave this world on a permanent basis. We don't think about that. Many times we don't believe that. But we are. And once you leave this world, it's eternal. 
There's no second chances. All this stuff you see on television is suggesting reincarnation. It suggests that a person can come back. It suggests that a person stays here on Earth in a different round to finish up their business and do whatever. I don't believe any of that. I don't believe it because whether you believe it or not, I see a bit differently than the average person. So I can't be fooled in that respect. I know what they are. Once you're done here, you're done. And everything here matters and it counts. And you cannot do it again. So your father is very serious about you being here. And everything in your life is serious, which is why many of you have certain conditions that have to do with decay. It has to do with the running down of your body in specific ways to get your attention. Because there are still portions of our lives that are just like our bodies. We cleaned up the outside. We did not touch the inside. Now it's time to tackle that. I pray this will assist you in your walk. Walking away from what was to walk into a brand new day that you can see that you can be a witness of the deliverance of Christ for real so that nothing can ever defeat your faith again because situations will try to defeat your faith people without knowing will attempt that Satan will certainly attempt that and you're a target you've been a target all this time that's why many of you have talents you have skill sets but you will not do them do you know why because you have a worth problem a worth issue confusion when you go to put your hands to something. It's almost like you're assaulted by an army of things, thoughts, and feelings. And it ruins what you're attempting to put your hands to. Then you end up saying, what's the point? It's time to get beyond that. It's time to be whole. Now, we're going to go to the next topic. After forgiveness is your actual faith. Many people, when they come to Christ, they come to Christ in a broken condition. In fact, many people come to Christ in many different conditions. What are the most common conditions? is a brokenness. Now, I'm not talking about the time when you responded in front of everybody else. And in happiness, you accepted it, you did. But then all too often, people go back home and they don't experience any change. Many of you, after you went to some altar, after you did what you did, it was only after that point you had your moment with Christ. That moment was normally by yourself. Nobody else was around in the reality of the cross hit you right in the heart and you understood in that moment you understood the cross for many it's like their minds and their souls explode with a lot of truth and in that moment you see who Christ is most often for the first time it is a very genuine moment and you also see the weight of your sins and then when you go to the cross you're not playing you're quite serious and again just to make note you're also by yourself by your lonesome, nobody else is around. Sometimes it begins with a, or possibly one of those uh, movies, like uh, they used to play Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, Moses, they used to play that a lot, and those movies did affect people in a very positive impact on people, especially lots of soldiers, right? But all too often that happens. You give your life to Christ, and then you begin to feel a difference in that moment by yourself. Now, it doesn't always happen like that, but everybody has a moment of clarity. Your Father in Heaven is not a lawyer. If any choice is given to you from the Most High, you must have comprehension of what you're choosing. And He will present to you darkness and light perfectly. But you comprehend both. Both require a situation. Normally, you're thrust into a, an impossible situation that's very dark until you see that it is dark. And you begin to notice the contrast and you say, I don't belong here. This is not me. During those moments, you often adopt an attitude that you had to be real with the Lord. And then you start to fight to be genuine. Anybody know what I'm talking about? That fight you have to be genuine with Christ? Nobody on earth knows about this fight but you. It's something you never tell anybody else. It is something that you do. You want to be genuine with Christ. Anybody ever get tired? Of being a hypocrite you get tired of appearing to be something you're not inside you know you're not that person inside you get tired of that those are acts of sincerity but when you accepted the lord many still were hoping he would heal their entire lives listen to me when a person goes to christ it is the world that has you looking for something you do know that it is the world that brings up a bunch of scriptures of what Jesus will do. It is the world that sows these into people and has them think about that. 
And they really do believe that if they get saved, their situation could be saved. If they get saved, something else can be salvaged or put back together. And they're hopeful for those things. But here's what happens when it does not come. Discouragement falls like heavy rain. Massive discouragement. And all the old things rush back. They come back. And you, you've still accepted Christ. But the misery comes. The trials come. The loneliness comes. All sorts of things come. See, had somebody told us the truth in the beginning, there would be no loneliness. There would be no sorrow. be none of that. Nobody saying, well, you know, I'm this type person, and, and, and so and so is this type person, and so things happen differently. No, they don't. We respond differently because we operate from a philosophy of the world and not of the living God, but of the world. And when we throw that out, everything changes. So it's good to examine that. We're going to examine that with Christ tonight. And again, don't be offended. Please don't be offended. Just hear it out so you can accomplish something. If you guys are not delivered, then all this is in vain. It really is. So I want you guys to turn to Luke 14. And it came to pass as he went to the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day. But they watched him. And behold, there was a certain man before him which was the dropsy. And Jesus answering spake unto the lawyers and the Pharisees saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And they held their place. And he took him and healed him and let him go. And answered them saying, Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen in a pit and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? So Jesus says, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? There was a person there that had, it, it says here, it says, drops as akin to a, well, uh, think of it as palsy or something like that. So a person there was sick. They were maimed. They had a bad disease. And Jesus takes this person and he says, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And I want you guys to hear me on this because there's a fight involved that you're also involved with. And it's gone to a different level. And it's important that you be victorious in this. Always. He says, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And they held their place and they took him and healed him. Right? Let him go. And answering them said, this is what Jesus did. He said, which one of you is going to have an ass or an ox fall into a pit? Will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day. And it says, and they could not answer him again to these things. And he put forth a parable to those which were bidden, which he told to come. When he marked how they chose out of the chief rooms, saying unto them, now listen, he said, he put forth a parable to those which were bidden, which were told to come. When he marked or emphasized how they chose out of the chief rooms, how they chose the best places to have their vote, the best house, the best room in the house, the best clothes in the store, the best car on the lot, you name it. They wanted the best. In fact, don't they teach that? You're supposed to have the best. Isn't that what people teach? That God wants you to have the best? Let me tell you something. Yes, God wants you to have exactly what he has to give. But God never said, I want you to have the best the world offers. That's not what he said. He did not say, I want you to have the best the world offers. He said, I want you to have the best that I offer, which is everything I offer. But if you're, if you're not, listen, if, if you're not on the same wavelength, you're going to buy the statement from those who spoke of the world. When men say it, oh, God wants you to have the best. Wait a minute, you ought to stop and say the best of what? The best of what the world offers? No, thank you. The best of what? Because they have to clarify that. You see what happens if you leave that open? Now, let's read this parable. Jesus says, when thou art been of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee, he that told you to come, and is this in him, and say to thee, give this man a place, and thou begin with the same, with, with shame to take the lowest room. Here's scenario. You're invited to a wedding. He says, don't go, don't go get the best place, lest a more honorable person than you show up. In the room that you just had, which was the best, they give it to the Next guy that came in that was better than you, that they deemed better than you. Listen, that they deemed better than you. And they tell you to get out of that room and go to the lower place and you do so with shame because they're housing somebody else. Do you guys listen? That means this is a, this is one of those life situations that people don't even know about. He just said, 
He just said, when you are invited to a wedding, do not take the best accommodations because somebody else will surely come who men will count more worthy than you, more honorable than you, more valuable than you are. And they will take you out of the place you chose, putting you in a lower room or establishment, and then put that other person in that place where you were. You know what that will breed within you? Loss, worthlessness. You'll feel worthless. There was a person with you in your life. Now listen, Jesus speaks this way. These are Satan's ploys in your life. There was a person in your life, and they put you in a high position. But all of a sudden, they took you out of that high position. Whatever you were receiving from this individual, it stopped and somebody else started receiving it right in front of your face. And it tore you to shreds on the inside. Everybody awake? It ripped you, ripped something out of you. It made you feel, this happens in people's families. Listen, and it's, the people don't know they're doing it. They have no idea they're doing it. They have no idea that they're taking from you, giving it to somebody else, but in your eyes... You're seeing them withdraw something from you, giving it to somebody else, causing you to feel like you're nothing. Praising somebody else when you labored and did all the work. When you established something first and almost, you know, gave up a lot doing it. And then they could so easily look past you into somebody else. You know who does that? When Satan gets a hold of people, that's precisely what they do. And if you don't know this, if you don't know it, you'll not know how to read what a person is doing. You'll not know how to see the situation for what it truly is. But you'll buy, you'll believe the presentation. And what I'm telling you is, don't believe the presentation. Know the principles of Christ and the activities of Satan. You'll see them everywhere in your life. You don't respond against the person. The person has no idea of their orchestrating this, but Satan does. And when he tears you down, and when he defeats you, when men, when people make you feel like nothing, do you not know that you feel worthless to the most high? And then something else happens. Once you feel worthless within yourselves and you get around other believers who believe like you, guess what you begin to do? You want placement among them because you want someone to say, hey, you matter. You want someone to see what you've sacrificed. You want someone to see what you did that was genuine. When you get that way, you end up competing with everybody else entering into things you shouldn't. For example, why would a biblical argument ever take place in the first place? If we all know God is right, and we all know that we are flawed, why would there ever be a biblical argument? It's when we try to prove ourselves to somebody else because they don't know we're hanging on a thin rope. They don't know that all somebody had to do, some of you with your parents, all your parents had to do was say, job well done. If they would have said that to you, it would have made everything worthwhile. If they would have seen, acknowledged you. So what is the Lord saying? Don't set yourself up for that. He's telling you exactly what people will do. If somebody invites you somewhere and tells you to come on, wants you to be, to, to sit in the high seat in a position, don't take it. He's saying don't do that because they are placing people based on value to them. And you will think it's about you. And it's not about you. It's about anybody who walks, who was also invited. Notice he said, when you are bidden. He didn't say when you're commanded. That's not what he said. He said when you're invited, when you're invited to come to a function or to come in somebody else's thing, he said sit not down in the highest room. Don't sit down in the highest room. Don't take the highest room. He said unless a more honorable man than, than you be bidden of him. And he that bade you and him come and say to you, give your place to this man. And how does it end? And it says, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. How many of you has that happened to? Did somebody say they invited you into their lives? They invited you into whatever they invited you in. They said, hey, you, you take this position. Because you're awesome. You take this position. But then somebody else walks in or somebody else pops into the relationship or somebody else comes in to whatever you were, were invited into. And they're more valuable than you are. All of a sudden, all that attention that you were getting, everything that you were getting is now going to somebody else. That has happened in relationships. It happens in families a lot. And you tell me, how can this happen in families over and over and over again? It's right here in the Bible. Yet people are not discussing this because it's a major 
thing in families. It's a major thing in relationships. Ladies, you know it. Men, you know it for real. Men know this one better than you ladies. They know what it is for someone to depend on them. They know what it is for someone to look to them because men are natural born providers. They know what that is. But then if that other person finds somebody else more valuable than whatever stock they had in you, they would draw and put somebody else. When a man sees this, it's heartbreaking to him. But a man will not say anything for the most part. They won't. So all of you know about this, ladies, you know about this, men, you know about this, young people, you know about this. It's happening in your families. Those of you who held a specific position among your family, and then all of a sudden somebody else comes. And how they used to favor him. They used to favor you, but not anymore. These are ways that men, and the Lord is saying, don't set yourself up for this. Let's continue. He says, but when thou art bidden, when you're invited, go and sit down in the lowest room. Now listen, this is, this is awesome the way this is. He says, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit and meet with thee. Now if you don't believe the words of Christ are real, then I'm going to tell you something. The next time you're around your family, the next time, you're around all your friends or anybody. Take the lowest position, which means be a servant of your friends. Take the low position. And sure enough, somebody will say, hey, you have done this and you have done that. You have done that. Take a load off. We got it from here. How many would be shocked if that ever happened? Same thing happens at your job. Same thing happens in everything in life. The Lord is showing you something. See, when men perceive that you're in a high position, they're always, listen, they will always evaluate you with somebody else. And the Lord's saying, don't take that position. When you take the lowest position among men or among women, when you take that low position, when everybody else's input is important and you just reserve yours, he's telling you what's going to happen. Because when you follow his ways, it just so happens. Devils, demons of darkness cannot operate. They can operate if you take that position, that high seat. If you're complicit with taking that high position, they're going to do their thing to knock you down. If you start at the lowest position, they scream. You know why? You took away their ability to knock you down. You just took it away. And because you took that away, they can't operate. When they can't operate, people begin to see you for who you are, for what you've done. And they will always say, hey, come up higher. They'll see your value. They'll see your worth. They'll see that. I use an example in CRT of a guy who's tired, blew out on the highway. Now imagine a guy, you're, you're driving down the highway, you see a fellow out there, and he's flagging everybody down because his tire blew out. He's flagging everybody down. He's saying, hey, come help me with this tire. How many of you would speed up? You would not stop. you speed up. Wouldn't you speed up? What if you took an exit, came all the way back around, this guy's still flagging people down, trying to make them help him. You'd speed up. You'd be repulsed. But here's the difference. If you saw an older guy doing everything he could to change your tire all by himself with inadequate tools, and you know it's a struggle for him because you just saw him struggle, do you not know you'll pull over? You'll say, hey, let me help you out, won't you? You'll say, hey, let me help you. That's when compassion is drawn out of you. That's when a principle is at work. That's when darkness cannot operate. Because when you try not to get in everybody's way, when you're not demanding help all the time, the Lord does something. Because, by the way, it is the Lord who will open the eyes of anybody to actually see you. It is the devil and his minions that will cause one to close their eyes on you and to have you replaced. You see the difference? If you start out in a position where you look like the highest and you are the person, devils will operate, shut somebody's eyes to your worth and have them look at somebody else they will always do this plus you're marked you're running around with a big sign on you that says i believe in christ people cannot see it but every devil in existence can see it every demonic entity can see it every fallen angel can see it every leftover nephilim they can see it humans can't see it and because you're walking around with this sign can you imagine a person who's walking around with a big sign that says i belong to so and so group well guess what happens when you walk into the room and take that high position you just irritate it to everybody who's against that group and of course they're going to have you removed 
of course they're going to put you into a lower seat because you just stirred the spiritual pot of demonics. And they're going to do everything they can because you become the daily challenge. Let's not, uh, let's not water world down. Let's not Gerard down. Let's not angel down. All these different, let's knock them down. You start out in that low position, you're marked as somebody who believes in Christ. Demons cannot operate. There's a principle at play. The Lord said, but when you're at the top of that ladder, when you're lifted up, when you're in a high place, he'll bring you low. That's what he said. When you have been abased, which is to be bought down low, anybody who dwells at that lower position can look up and see everything. Your perspective is different. Everything is different. The Lord said he would raise you up. He'd raise you up. Are you starting to see this? If you take that high position, who do you become in that high position? If you go sit the president seat and you agree, if somebody says, hey, why don't you sit in the president's seat? Well, guess what? And they tell you, hey, why don't you just take that position? You are the president and everything is coming to you. Everything is coming to you. But if you become the janitor, you don't draw the attention of darkness because you're not competing with mankind. Remember, demons are sticklers for the law. Do you know that? And do you guys know about meekness and temperance? Galatians 5, 23, 5, listen, 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long, suffering, goodness, or, or uh, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Against such there is no law. Demons want to accuse you of breaking the law. Satan wants to accuse you of breaking the law. So what do you do? You cannot step into a position of highness right away because we can't keep the law if we try. But if you take that humble position, there is no law and demons cannot touch you. There it is. They will touch you if you're one of those who's trying to uphold the law all by yourself. If you step into a position and brag how you're keeping the law, oh, they're coming after you. They're going to make an example out of you. And they will succeed in knocking you down. But if you are already in that humble position, if you're already full of meekness and the fruits of the Spirit, basically, against such there is no law. And where there's no law, you don't have the opposers of the law coming to you. Do you see that? Hey, this part of your self-defense and a true walk here. And the Lord is opening your eyes. This is spiritual combat. Let's continue. He says, listen, after he gives this advice, Luke 14, 11 says, For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself will be exalted. There it is. How many of you have messed up that principle? And Lord knows. I did this so many times. You know how when you, when I was young, right? I, I took everything apart and put it back together. I used to fix people's things. Now, when I didn't open my big choppers, I do a great job. Say, for example, somebody threw something away. They said, oh, you can have this. It doesn't work anymore, right? So I would fix it up. And after I got it back in perfect working order, the person would come back and say, yeah, I think I want my thing back. They do it all the time. But here's the key. I was able to fix it and enhance it. My parents did not like the fact that people would come back with their stuff only after I had essentially restored it. But there was, I remember one time, somebody said, uh, you know, can you fix it? Oh, yeah, I can fix it. You know how many things I've fixed? I've fixed a lot of things. And do you know what happened? I couldn't fix it. In fact, I messed it all up. I mean, I messed it up beyond repair. And it happened again. And I noticed something. Every time I give my credentials to another person, there's no blessing in my hands. I learned this early. No blessing. But every time I take the lowly path, my hands are always different. You know how when you're plunking with something, then all of a sudden it starts working. And somebody says, well, what did you do? And you know in your heart, you didn't do anything. You don't know what you did. It just started working. I was even tested on that. People would have broke things. They'd hand it to me. All of a sudden, it would start working. Get it back. One day, somebody said, uh, they, it was a group of people, and they said, hey, did you get that fixed? I said, yes. And the guy turned around and said, I told you we could depend upon him. And I'm sitting there blown up in the head like, oh, this worked in my favor. The same day it broke down again, worse than the first time. Then they bought it to me, and I couldn't fix it. And then the reputation was gone as being the person they could count on to have something fixed. All because, all because, I sat there and let them think that the lie they had within them that I fixed it was true, and it was not. So I learned from that one too, and people would then bring things to me, and the same thing would happen. Before I could apply everything, it would just all of a sudden start to work. And they would say, wow, you're good. You, you know, you're really good. And I said, no, it's not me. 
call it a good touch, call it this. I said, but I'm, let me tell you something. I took two screws out, the thing started working. And it worked for life. It is it worked. In most cases, it outlasted everything else they had. I got used to telling people that wasn't me. That was the Lord guiding me. It had to be, not me. And when I do that, nothing breaks down. I used to convert a lot of kids, a lot of computers, and convert them for modern operating systems and give them back to the school. So all the schools that I gave to, they gave computers for the kids. And I donate them. One time, some board folks had called me, got in contact with me somehow. And uh, so I, you know, I talked to them a little bit. And they said, uh, you know, you're, you've got a fast turnaround on this thing. And we have a warehouse full of so-and-so. We'd like you to get this done for universities and we're willing to do this. And I had to tell them, no, I can't do that for any contract. And they were just puzzled because it was, it was outrageous. I would never take a job like that or I would accept any money for something I'm doing to help out somebody else. Because I know the day I do, kapoof. Plus, it's outside of the principle of humility. Now, I've seen others try it. I knew what was going to happen, and it failed. Now, listen, I'm telling you guys all of this and this parable to let you know something. There are principles. And in your moments where you don't know when or how to do something, there are principles that should guide your life. The Lord gently shares parables with us. And if you apply them, to hear them and then to do them and then reflect upon your own life. You're going to see the truth in them. And once you see that truth, they become something greater than a parable. See, God's principles never, ever fail. Our attitudes draw things to us, negative things, and it gets overwhelming. Like when you guys invited someone into your life that you shouldn't have. And when you did, you couldn't get rid of the person. They bought everything down and then you hopped and moved somewhere else thinking somehow a new environment is the answer. But then you invite the same type of person back into your life again and your environment of peace turns into AT double hockey sticks again. And that's when you discover when the Lord blesses me with something of peace, I've got to check everybody at the door. You can't allow anything to come into your life and to rob you of the peace the Lord has bestowed upon you. Nothing can steal your peace, but you keep giving your peace to something else that dominates your household while you're in it. See, when you had those moments of peace, it was your house. It was your standard. But then slowly but surely, you start giving into things called relaxation of the world. When you do that, you're allowing these dominant forces to come into your environment, rip it to shreds. So you can't afford to ever do that again. You check everything at your door. Everything. Do you guys have that? I'm telling you these things because over the course of your lives, certainly if you're listening to me tonight, all these things have worked against you collectively, causing you to be in specific positions. It seems like you can't escape. And I'm just giving you real-world examples of parables that are taking place in your life all the time. You can undo that. And they would help you throughout the rest of the process. But when you have openly invited invaders into your abode, nobody can help you until you do something about it. You have to do something about that. I mean, continue, because this is about to get good. Then said he also to him that made him, to the one that called, called him to, he says, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, nor thy kinsmen, nor thy neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and recompense be made for thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. Uh oh Remember I said, don't be offended. How many times have you guys performed something? You got excited. You said, wow, I want, I want, my, I want my best friends here. I want this here. Hey, guys, let's come over. I fixed this pretty neat thing I think you'll enjoy. Come over, let's enjoy it. How many have done that? How many of you have accomplished something and you couldn't wait to tell one of the people that are supposed to be your family or even your friends? How many have done that? How many of you have prepared something and you invite your family and friends to partake of it? You know what the Lord says? Don't do that. Boy, it just confused everybody. He said, don't do that. You know how in the world they say, hey, you should have people over your house, your family over your house all the time. And uh, nope. Lord saying, don't do it. Why? We're about to learn why. So let me read this again. He says, when you make a dinner or a supper, call not your friends nor your brethren, neither your kinsmen, nor 
your rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again and recompense thee, uh, or recompense be made to thee. He said, but when you make us a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee. They cannot repay you. Now, let, let, me, let me get this right. So he says, don't make something for someone who can partake of what you did and then repay you somehow. You know how you say, hey, cousin Foofy Chew, I'm going to go ahead and cut your grass this week. And then after you cut their grass, they come, they say, hey, I'll pay you if you cut my grass again the way you did. And you're like, yes, that's, that's what I wanted. And then, you know, it's a business. You can't be blessed for that because what you're blessed with is payment. It's just payment. That's your blessing. What the Lord is saying is this. Go and render things to those who cannot repay you so your Father in heaven can bless you. Whatever you do, do things in love for those who cannot repay you. You're about to learn why. Let's continue to read. He says, you'll be blessed. He says, but when you make a feast, call the poor, the maim, the lame, the blind. Thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee. For thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat the bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto them, this is what Jesus said, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say unto them, to, to say to them that they were bidden, that they were welcome to come. For all things are now ready. So he said, he, he sent somebody out to say all, men, all things are ready for the wedding. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuses. The first said on him, ah, you know, I bought a piece of ground, and I must needs uh, go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I bought five yoga boxes. Now you're going to prove them. Right? That means he's going to use them to see if they pay off. And he said, I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor, the maimed, and the halt, the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is, it, he said, It is done as thou hast commanded. And yet there is room. And the Lord said to the servant, Go out to the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. Right? All of you know this, by the way. For I say unto you, listen, he says, he says, go get, you know, everybody else you can find that my house may be filled. For I say unto you, that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Now, why is he using this parable? Well, you have to look at what he just talked about. He just gave a parable about not taking the high seat in somebody's establishment. Because they're going to have somebody come in and give you the low position and you're going to be shamed. He said, you, listen, he said, you come in. When you're bidden, when you're invited to something, you come in and take the low position. And he said, why? Why? His, his example is why. He's giving you a principle that everything, he said, everything, everything, whatsoever exalteth himself shall be abased. Whatever thinks of himself to be high is going to be bought low. He says, and he that humbleth himself, the one that takes that low position because he sees everybody else is more valuable than he the Lord says, that person is going to be exalted. First principle. Now, many of you, you've gotten knocked down a lot. But I want you to think of something, too. When you were knocked down, was it not that you, by the world's definition, were attempting to accomplish some things, right? You wanted success, success, success. And so being successful, part of that in this world is presentation. And so what do people right now present themselves as? Qualified. I hear arguments all the time and people say, oh, but I have my certifications for this and for that. I hear, you know, I heard two pastors talking about that, about their experience in an argument. They were talking about experience and one had delivered, you know, a lot of people and the other one didn't deliver so much and the other one did this over the other one. Well, the Lord is showing us the principle of our father. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. The world they operate by the principles. The rich people of the world operate by the principles of Christ. And you know the person of Christ. And it's time that you employ the principles of Christ. If you employ the principles, you will both know the Christ 
and be blessed by him. You cannot be blessed by the living God when you defy his ways. And he's sharing something with you. See, people have made it a point to give messages of blessings. And the Lord is showing you how to get blessed. The Father's way, not the mythical way. That if you take that humble position in everything, you will be exalted. But if you take that high position in everything, you will be abased. You're going to be brought down low. Why does this matter to you over everybody else? Because you believe in Christ. That's why. How many times in your life have you been knocked all the way down to the bottom? As soon as it looked like you were at the top. How many times have you said, why is this situation happening to me again? Why do I break out and I start to make it? And this series of events knocks me down to the bottom. And you become depressed and discouraged and tired. Because you're operating outside of the principles of the living God. Consequently, he's not just telling you to do this so you can get something from him. It's a known fact that if anybody who truly believes takes the path of humility and meekness, then that person will begin to see what they never saw before. Now, you have to be a believer to have this happen to you. But you'll begin to see what you never saw before. That's a fact. You cannot be blessed if you're lifted up internally all by yourself, thinking that somehow you're worth more than the other person. You're more knowledgeable than the other person, more qualified than the other person. You will not be blessed the most time with that. And how many of you know you've had good positions, but something came to rob every dime you ever had? Some situation would come to you out of the blue to take the leftovers nobody else knew about. If you had 17 bucks left in your wallet, after losing 17,000, some issue would pop up and somebody's going to need what? 17 bucks. The very last that's in your wallet. How many people have those supernatural friends or family and you think they have a, a some kind of camera in your wallet? Come on now. It's a good time for a confession. How many of you have had a specific amount of money and somebody who's always asking for this and the other, they can buy and ask for that, that amount? How many have gotten where they need to be and then an accident with somebody took place? And it just so happens you were not covered medically for that accident. Yet weird stuff like that happens. The Lord has shown you what these principles are. How not, how not to be on the negative side of these principles. But he will also show you why he does this. Can I interject something? The word is so rich. Not only did Jesus speak about the parables, but he gave you principles within the parables you could easily relate and understand. But not only did he do that, he turned around and told you why the Father works by way of these principles. Third, you sit at the beginning of a massive event that will cause a deep regret within about, I'd say, 90% of the inhabitants of the earth. The deepest regret anybody has ever had, they will have. And it will engulf 90% of those who live on the face of the earth right now. When that time comes, there are going to be so many people who feel cursed rather than blessed. There are going to be people hurt, crushed, and everything else because it happened too quickly. You are not to be one of those who are not flourishing in that time. You are not to be one of the people who will carry the curse of curses in that time. You're to be the ones who are free. You are to be the reason these things come in the first place. But you cannot think of yourself as higher than anybody else on this earth. That's not your father's way. And it carries punishment. It carries decay. You'll have no life doing things that way. The Lord communicates to us that we're going to absolutely rock down to the core if we continue to live our lives by these earthly standards, discarding his ways of truth. That means your situation, the one you're having right now, is not comparable to the one that's coming. But even the one right now will start to consume you. Totally. That path of humility is something you really must understand. We're not talking about weakness. See, because let me tell you guys something about strength and weakness. Do you not know it's easy to lash back out at somebody? It's so easy. It's easy to retaliate. It is not easy to take everything that somebody could ever give and to stand and never accuse them. That's not easy. It's not easy to sacrifice all that you have. And then those, I'll, I'll give you a real world example and see what you would do. Imagine yourselves, you're deep undercover and you're helping people a lot. 
But then one of the people you help comes back and they launch a campaign against you, a hate campaign. You know, they go through the routine, how, you know, ignorant you are and that, uh, you know, you're the, you're the, you're some AI matrix something, you're fake, phony, they use all the words. And then you find out this person is in trouble again and you sacrifice every meal you would eat for a month so this person would have a home. Now they have an active campaign and you do what you do anonymously. So instead of withdrawing your kind heart to the person, you sacrifice everything you were about to consume upon yourself for the month. Your budget for the month you sacrifice and give it to the person who launched a hate campaign against you. How would you feel after doing that? How many of you would feel pretty good after doing that? That means you're not going to eat for a month. That means you're really not going to eat for a month. But at least this guy has a home. The same guy is tearing you down every single day with grievous things. And imagine another month pops up. And they still need help. They're not out of the red yet. So you do it again. Now, having sacrificed and starved yourself, let's say you lost maybe 100 pounds, right? 100, I just make it 150. And this person still does the same thing. But you never waver. You never waver in your assistance towards them. How many of you would feel like you have done the dumbest thing on the planet? How many would feel that way? That'd be hard to do, wouldn't it? Would that be difficult for you guys to do? Would it be difficult for you guys to still sacrifice to the one who's launching a hate paint campaign against you? Would it be difficult? Somebody says, I couldn't do it twice. Good answer. Somebody says, yes, it's a good answer. Let me tell you why yes and I couldn't do it twice is a good answer. Because we all know, we all know, if, if a person says, that wouldn't bother me a bit, then I ask you this, why do we always have something to say about politicians? Why do we always have something to say about presidents and things of that nature? If it truly wouldn't bother us to sacrifice to the ones who hate us the most, we would have nothing bad to say about anybody, would we? Because the day we can treat our worst enemy with respect and with love and still make sacrifices, that's the day we stop being accusers and you enter into the work. But by entering into the work, you also enter into his rest. Whose rest? The rest that Christ promised us the rest that the prophets could not enter that rest resting in christ which is the finding that security to rest means relax it means you're not stressed it means all that stuff is gone and the only place that can be is within christ but to be within christ you have to know him you have to believe in him and everything else and you cannot be a friend of the world and the bible says to love this world is to have enmity with god with God to love this world. But if you were to drop the world's philosophies they've been giving you and act on the Lord's principles and begin to believe his principle, everything in your life that shouldn't be there would be instantly broken because there's no need to have anything broken for you anymore because you're in the place of all protection because you're where you should be. You will have started your eternity here on this earth. How amazing is that? So why won't people do it? Because of the world, the world has taught you to see an enemy differently than what God described it. Just as love is different as spoken by our Father, so is enemy different when spoken by our Father. An enemy in the Word of God is not the same thing as your enemy taught by the world. Love that's taught by the world is not love as described to us and exercised on us by the living God. So the world has one set of definitions. But if you apply that set to your life with Christ, you're going to go astray. That's been happening a lot. How can you love your enemies? If you're truly sacrificing for someone and you have nothing for love for someone, are they still an enemy? The answer is no. Why would, why would the Lord say, love your enemies? Why would he say that? Because before you understand his principles, you're going to see them as an enemy. Once you begin to live within his principles, you have no enemies. Isn't that something? In my life, you guys would say, you know, if you didn't know Christ, you say, well, Mike, I think you've got some enemies out there. They're not enemies. First of all, if they say that I would hurt someone, they don't know me. And if they don't know me, yet they are describing me based on something else, they are beguiled. Satan has them. They're still not my enemy. They're in massive bondage. How many enemies do you guys have? 
You cannot have enemies in your life. Not with your phone. Mankind does that. It teaches you how to categorize people based upon their terms and conditions. Your father does not. And if we're going to believe the father and walk, time for us to believe the word of God. Not Lex. You know who Lex is? Lexicon. It, we can't believe the lexicon anymore. The Lord's giving us principles of how to be blessed. Now, I don't know about you, but I'll tell you something. I cannot exist in this world and I would not be sustained without blessings. There is no sustainment outside of blessings for me. And you all are to be blessed, but not the way the world has described it. You are to be kept, but not as the way the world described it. And the only way to be actually blessed is to see these parables in truth. I mean, really see them. To walk and operate within them. Because they are, in fact, godly principles. And they will never change. Some of you, you cannot begin specific things until you are blessed. Because you are supposed to be blessed, not cursed. Do you all know that? You are not supposed to be cursed. You're not supposed to have the same attitude the world does in anything. And you are not supposed to be blind, nor inhibited. You are supposed to be whole. So what's stopping it? We are. We're stopping it because we keep taking the high seat. We keep taking the places where we can be esteemed. We keep wanting to be recognized. We're actually trying to make those and those archetypes, the people in their types, accept us because they originally rejected us. Did you know that when somebody rejects you, you'll find yourself going back and going back and going back again to attempt to prove to them that you're worth something, especially for those who have called you nothing. Do you know that? Why would a family member go to another family member with the word of God knowing that they're not going to listen to them? Why would a person ever do that? Can anybody answer that? A lot of people say, I had a great concern. Really? But you went to them more than once and more than once they said, hey, I'm not talking to you about this. Because here it is, you ready? In too many cases, we want to be the one that participated in their salvation. We want to be the ones that hold that seed of importance in their lives. But why is that? Because those are the ones who rejected you. Those are the ones, the very ones who rejected you, the very ones who withheld their love, the very ones that betrayed you. People are running around with a strong desire to be seen. When they do that, they take it upon themselves to do a great many things with their families. If the Lord sends you, that's a different story. If we send ourselves, that's when the whole vehicle gets stuck. That's when the whole truck is stuck in the sand. But when the Lord sends us, he made us a highway to get there. When we send ourselves, we get stuck on rough terrain. Why would we ever choose to do that in the first place? I'll say it again. Because we have been hurt, we want someone to accept us, to see what we are, to see our value, to let us know that we have some value because we, and, and you know what, half time we don't see this because we're starving. Most Christians are starving and they shouldn't be. And I'm giving you the reasons why. Something that all of you must overcome because listen, these are also called footholds. You guys know what a foothold is? A foothold is when you can put your foot in something and you'll no longer fall off whatever you put your foot in. Demonic entities in darkness have a foothold in many of us. Uh-oh. They have a foothold. And we made that foothold and refused to move it. They cause people to crave sinful things and to the point where you give in and do it and you feel like trash afterward. How you purposely engaged in it. And that's when you noticed, locked up inside you, are wounds that have never been touched. Once you're free of that, though, that's when everything you look at becomes twice as bright. Have you guys ever heard of a person when no spirits are with them at all, when they're free of spirits? One of the first things is they become very thankful and full of peace and joy. So let me ask you this. How many people have their peace disrupted? How many people's peace is disrupted? If something is shattering your peace... It has fed you a vision, an interpretation of something that is absolutely not of your father. The next step is to get your peace back. You have forgiven. Now you need your peace back. Remember that peace you had when you were tiny? Many of you remember. Some of you don't. But when you were tiny, there were times when everything was all right. Sometimes in your adult years, the same thing. It was when everything was all right. 
But somehow you knew something was going to happen. You knew you could feel it trying to press its way in. Something didn't like your situation being in peace, and it instantly was drawn to it and began to exploit your spiritual house for breaches, weaknesses, open windows and doors so it could come in and shed its darkness all over the place. In fact, that was the time when you had something I call grade vision. It's when everything got a bit darker. Your peace was stolen. This parable about the ones invited. The Lord's also given us a type road map of what's happening. He said that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. The ones who were initially invited. Now he said his supper. Why were they so busy? Does anybody know? You ever have someone invite you to dinner? Or to invite you to anything? And I'm so, so guilty of this. If somebody invites you to something, all of a sudden, you come up, you, you have a lot to do. You're busy. You can't make it. When we are too busy with our own lives, we prioritize ourselves as first. Everything else is secondary. When we have a problem, we prioritize that problem as the number one issue in our lives and everything else is secondary. What does the Lord say? When it comes to Him, when He has invited us to walk in His ways, all too often we're too busy with our own lives to pay total attention until something happens to what happens to you guys. Until you start having experiences, your nights are disrupted, things start going down the tubes, all sorts of things, deeper challenges. And why? Look back in your life at the time when you really didn't have time for Christ. You guys remember that? You were still going to church and you still loved him, but you did not have time to do things his way because you already had a way. And you were trying to get your work done so you could sit down, lastly, and listen to what the Lord said. We do that all too often. Now, he warned us and he said that none of those men which were bidden the first ones come to the dinner and they were too busy. They gave excuses. He said, they will not taste of his supper. They won't taste of the meal he prepared for all of them. Keep in mind, if you go to a wedding, a meal is prepared for everybody, not just those who are getting married. Everybody takes part. But if you're too busy, you can't come. If, you're, if you just recently started something, you can't do it. This is precisely what we have done. And in so doing, what do we do? Because we're so busy, we fill in the blanks missing the heart of most real things folks we can't afford to miss the instruction of christ because we have seen the outcome you guys have experienced the outcome of what happens when you do things your way i'll tell you right now when i do things my way it blows up in my face i used to get so busy sometimes that i would do it my way not the lord's way and then after everything went wrong then I will go back and start listening to the Lord once everything hit the bottom. Somebody know what I'm talking about. This is part of your armor. This is absolutely part of absolute deliverance. Because if we don't yield to this, what good is it to be delivered? Only to be cut up by something else. Because we have no armor. Saying you have the armor is one thing. Having the armor is something different. And still donning or wearing the armor is something different than that. Many of you have spoken about the armor. You even may have put certain pieces on. But if you're tired, if you feel defeated, if you have all these conditions, your armor is not working. You guys see that? Because I'm going to save you the trouble of something that uh, I went through time and time again. You can speak about that armor all day long. That does not mean you're wearing it. God's armor has no flaws. The shield is not thick. The clothing is not heavy. We just have to have it on. We can proclaim that we have it on, but the, it's, it's not the same as wearing it. Once we start yielding to what the Lord says, now we're ready. Hear me on this, now we're ready. Now let me read this last part. It says, And there went out a great multitude with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me, and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Uh-oh, see, we hit a brick wall. Many of you may have the zeal to follow Christ and the heart to follow Christ. But wouldn't you love to be a disciple of Christ, a student of Christ? If you're a student, wouldn't that be the only way to really learn of him? Of course. 
and it's in your hearts to learn directly of him. It's also in your hearts to have looked at the alternatives. You all see that? He says, if any man come to me and hate not his father, mother, wife, children, brethren, and sister, yea, in his own life also he cannot be my disciple. We want to be students. It's in our hearts to be that way. But we cannot be his disciple. If, that's a strong language, if we hate not our father, mother, sister, wife, children, brothers, sisters, and our own life also. That's a strong word, hate. So in the Kno Greek, what this word actually is, what this phrase actually is, is just like hatred. It means in comparison to God, in comparison to a son, in comparison to the words of Christ. You do not love anything like that. See, if you don't love anything like you love the Lord's word, then nothing can stop you from acting in the word. And at that point, he can give you more and more and more. But imagine if you're reading your Bible and you're really getting somewhere and deep understanding hits you and all of a sudden your phone rings and then what you, you're, you're called out to do something. You're interrupted. How many people have been interrupted? When you get into the Word of God for the first time in a long time, you're starting to get this deep understanding. And sure enough, your kids cut up, your spouse cuts up, the house blows up, something happens to someone, your friends call, everybody's got a problem, all sorts of stuff starts happening. Now, if you yield to those distractions, how can you ever learn of the Lord? Be pretty difficult, right? Very difficult, in fact. So the language being used here, is if you don't hate them, in other words, in comparison with him, there should be no comparison. But the only way that's ever going to happen would to really love his word, to really love his word and be willing to act on his word, is when somebody, one of your loved ones, wants you to do something else, you said no. That's hard to do, right? In some cases, that'd be awful to do. How many of you have found it hard to keep the choice of somebody else in the book? Now, we're talking about discipleship students of the word of god and many many have a desire to be this but they can't because they're always going to be held back by something connected to their own immediate lives let's continue to read so you get the whole thing he says and whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple you know many people don't know how to bear their cross he said and whosoever doth not bear his cross well what happened at the cross persecution uh-oh. What happened at the cross? Persecution. What happened at the cross? A sacrifice. What happened at the cross? Jesus died. Let me continue. For if you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it, lest happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first to consult it, whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000, or else, while the other is yet far off, he sendeth an ambas uh, ambassage, ambassador or messenger and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath. He cannot be my disciple. What's the Lord saying? How many times has the Lord put something in you, all of you, who are having these strange experiences? How many times has the Lord put something in you, but you could not do anything about it because of the people around you, because of your position, the optics, how people are going to look at you? In this world of social media, you can't be seen doing everything and expect to keep the masses. Because in this world of social media, somebody can absolutely say something and make you close your Bible to go and dress whatever they said. They can alter or shift your servitude based on what is said. They can do a great many things based on what you've said. But to all those who are willing to give up some things, who are willing to forsake some things, those are the ones. Those are the ones who end up doing the beautiful kingdom work. But the Lord put that in your hearts to do a kingdom work for real. What has been stopping you? What's been stopping any of you from doing kingdom work? The work you love the most. What has been stopping you? What puts a halt on your prayer time? What puts a halt in your study time? What stops all these things? 
It's when we see the value of something else higher than the gospel. Here we go right back to perspective. When we see other things more important, we prioritize. If you guys got sick, if one of you got sick, just one person, if they got sick, how many people would just, you know, stop their broadcast for that sick person and not go forward with what the Lord gave them in the first place? How many people would, when the Lord hears one, when the Lord calls you to go and embrace someone, but your family says no, or your family has something else to do that's silly, stopping you from going to embrace that person? That's what the Lord is talking about here. When you have other priorities that can come along, and they're more important than the gospel. Because to be his disciple means eventually you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, empowered the Holy Spirit to work, to be a child of the kingdom of God. So I'll ask, I'll ask, are you guys ready to uh, really walk forward with Christ? First of all, how many of you, how many of you have a strong yearning to carry the gospel to someone? Didn't matter who. How many of you have a strong yearning to do that? You really want to carry the gospel to people. You see the beauty of the gospel, the truth of it. You want to carry it to somebody. You think it's important that people have this gospel. To fulfill that takes sacrifice. And how many of you are willing, and what are you willing to actually sacrifice? That's what you have to ask yourselves. Because with the Lord, when you carry the gospel of Jesus Christ, there are going to be dark spirits can cause another person to go through anything to stop you from going forward with the gospel. And when Satan cannot touch you directly, he'll go through everybody that you love. And it will eventually cost you everything. Hear me, I'll say it again. The gospel is going to cost you everything. In this last parable, the Lord is speaking of the importance of the gospel. You guys have a yearning inside you to carry the gospel to somebody else, but you're stopped in your tracks by those around you and other people who tend to influence you. You're also the one contacted by individuals, and they seek to change how you believe. And you must be careful. You don't carry a message of change within you, that when you talk to somebody else, you start molding them in a gospel that does not exist. There are too many cases where even married people have wanted to go forward with the gospel of Jesus Christ, but they could not do it. And the Lord has given, he's given a warning of this. So here it is. If you, because you are the ones who are at the midnight hour having, some of you have extraordinary issues. But what you may not know is that you're marked. So then evil spirits know exactly what you are. But going forward with the gospel is why circumstances keeps you away from everybody. How many of you would agree that something is trying to keep people away from you? How many people have the rumor mill started up on them? His tactics. Once you see his tactics and reevaluate yourselves. For example, I follow Christ for the purpose of Christ. I don't follow him for any healing. Not following Christ for anything I can get out of him. I'm not doing that. If many other people would do that. If they would follow Christ because he's Christ, follow him out of respect and honor, knowing what he did, you become unstoppable. It won't do Satan any good to work through anybody against you because nothing at that point is going to work. It's important that you guys have a faith-based walk, and so you have forgiven those who have done something against you. Now it's time to walk with Christ, not to get something but to walk with him because you agree with this gospel and because you want to help him accomplish what he came here to accomplish. And just in case you don't know what he came here to accomplish, he came here to undo the works of darkness in people. God will stop what Satan is doing everywhere else. But in people, there's a dark work happening. Jesus walked this earth. He did what he did. And all too often, we think, or we're following Christ for not necessarily the right reasons. And we're obedient, not necessarily for the right reasons. And this is what I want you to see. I want you to simplify your walk with Christ. Not to get something out of it. But because you believe in what he established. How many of you believe in the gospel, the good news, that, that all men should be given the opportunity by God Almighty to repent and to be saved and to be washed and to be cleansed? You are that element in the earth that will be used to break the assaults of darkness. Let's hope, I'm, I'm going to say after this, after this small challenge, this is the first one, just to evaluate Christ, you're following of him, not for purpose, but because you believe in his word. Listen, that means 
we just read in Luke. So what happens if you're sick? How many people would allow their sickness to get in the way of their servitude to Christ? Now, I'll tell you something. I've never let anything come in between my servitude to Christ. But not because I'm Rambo, but because I believe in what he's doing. The question is, do you guys believe in what he's doing now? To forsake everything just for him. Now, that doesn't mean you start throwing things away. It's not, it's not what it means. But can he be your priority, your first choice and not your last? You remember when he said, I give you my peace? He said, I give you my peace. So where's your peace at? If you don't have his peace within you, you've lost a part of him. Is so what I'm telling you is this. The world will teach you to love the Lord for the rewards he gives. The world will teach you that if you love him well enough, you'll be rich or you'll be, you know, you'll have substance you couldn't believe. The world is teaching you to follow Christ, to get something out of him, like it's a method in being successful. And what I'm asking you and trying to inform you about is the Lord said, don't follow him for that. How do I know that? Because he spoke it. He told those people after he fed them with the fish and the loaves, he told those people, he said, you're following me because I fed you. That's why you're following me, because I fed you. You're following me because your stomachs are full. You're following me to get food out of me, because you'll know, you know I'll feed you. That's why you're following me. Immediately after that, do you guys remember what happened? That's when, it, when that whole situation was confronted anyway, in your personal lives. When you drop the following Christ to get a bunch of stuff out of it, you essentially chain Satan up in your life. Once you establish this, even in your children's lives, you're going to see change come. They will notice a change in your house. The brightness return, and that's all up to you. Following him in genuineness, because you agree with this gospel. Because a lot of people don't ask this at first, do they? To believe upon his name is to believe upon what his name stands for. To know what his name stands for is to know what the gospel is. To know what the gospel is is to have heard the words of Christ. To have heard the words of Christ is to hear your father. This earth at one time, it split. Not split as in somebody cut it down the middle. But there's some recorded things people don't discuss. I probably shouldn't say it here. I'm going to say it anyway. Imagine the earth dividing just like a cell. And those who love their darkness and all this kind of stuff, we end up on the earth that's uh, cracked and ruined, still dirty, full of sin and all sorts of things. But imagine the other folks in a brand new place, a brand new place, a place without darkness, a place without any negativity, a place that is complete, a place where everything is alive and everything is good and all fragrances are good and you have a different body. Do you know what, what would happen if that were possible right now? And if it were going to, if it were prophesied to happen again, how many people would rush to be good? So they could be on the, in the good earth and not the bad one. Or how many people would do that? Do you guys know there's a written history of this? There, there, there's a, there's documentation of this all over the world. It's not discussed though. It already happened once. And the final time is coming. When all who are separated from the living God will be thrown into outer darkness. To mention that. Because we have some happenings in this earth right now. And it's very, very, very dark. And I can assure you that people are going to choose much darkness over light. Notice also in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved if you're not willing to repent? And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish.